The Breitling Chronomat. Fun fact, this was the first watch that I ever bought when I started to make a little bit of money. The Chronomat, depending on the year, depending on the condition, depending on the variation, can be found between $3,000 in six thousand dollars yes you can find the gold variations for more but again we're not talking about the gold variations we're talking about stainless steel between three and six grand it's also produced between 36 millimeter and 44 millimeter it's marketed as a unisex all-purpose watch it was the first luxury timepiece that i ever bought i remember the day it was called a white eye blue it had a blue dial with white chronographs and to me it was just the most beautiful thing that i had ever seen and i was so proud of myself for spending ten thousand dollars on it brand new from the authorized dealer what's up guys my name is chris i am an entrepreneur of almost 16 years at this point and i happen to coach entrepreneurs as well internationally starting and scaling their business to the eight figure mark. And the cool part is if you take this advice and use these tools on your day to day and your business, you could do it too. So let's get into the show. Five entry level luxury timepieces. Now, first things first, guys, I'm going to give you my perspective on the best five entry level luxury timepieces. However, before I start, I need to point out that I'm using a new microphone. So I thought it would be cool to put it on my hat. If you guys disagree, please tell me. I would like your opinion on the placement of my microphone and if it sounds any better, most importantly. We're not entirely sure. Audio is not our cup of tea, but we got this recommended to us, so we'll see how it goes. I'm looking forward to your feedback on this. Now, discussing the five entry level luxury timepieces. These are the best five pieces that I prefer and we sell the most of over the years. I say entry level because of the price tag associated, which for this context is going to be sub $10,000, even sub $5,000. We're looking at a few grand to get started. So let me explain to you about each piece. So first up is the Breitling Super Ocean. It could be found between $2,000 and $6,000, depending on the variation, the year, and the condition. It could also be found for more in gold variation, but typically speaking about two to $6,000. It comes between 36 millimeter and 46 millimeter, and it's considered a unisex diver. So men and women wear it. I don't see a lot of women wearing it. However, women can wear it. It is unisex and uh, Breitling does do a good job at making some of the smaller sizes look like ladies pieces. My favorite variation of the Breitling Super Ocean is the Breitling Super Ocean Heritage Chronograph Date. It's a really nice Super Ocean. It goes between four and five thousand dollars and it's my favorite variation. It's not necessarily the best. It's just the one I prefer. The Super Ocean is a super quality piece. Breitling originally said it was the competitor to the Rolex Submariner, and they do look kind of similar, I guess, but the Super Ocean, more importantly, is a great piece you can wear in the gym. You can wear it with a nice jacket. You can wear it with a suit. You can wear it at a wedding, and it competes with the Submariner technically. I wouldn't personally classify them as such. That's what Breitling says. All right, number two, the Breitling Navitimer. Depending on the variation, the year, and the condition, which play a huge part in watches, you can find this piece between $3,000 and $6,000. You could also find it for more than six grand in the gold variations. We're not talking about the gold variations that's why I'm kind of excluding them, but the stainless steel between three and $6,000. Breitling also makes this Navitimer and produces it as a unisex pilot's watch. 
match. It's produced between 32 millimeter and 48 millimeter, which is a huge difference. 32 millimeter is mostly targeted at a lady's Navitimer, and Breitling does do a good job at making it look like such. I would say the 41 to 48 millimeter is good for the males that wear the Navitimer just because it's a big watch. My personal favorite variation of the Breitling Navitimer has a blue dial in 43 millimeter. It's one of the newer generations of the Navitimer. They do a really good job with the different colors of blue and the 43 millimeter seems like a good solid pick that isn't too big. And I say too big because the Breitling Navitimer does wear very big. Let's be honest, when I used to wear these on a daily basis, I would smash them into everything. People, cars, doors, seatbelts, tables, pretty much everything. And truth be told, I was wearing too big of a watch. I was wearing a 46 millimeter Navitimer, or I thought I preferred 46 millimeter Navitimers, when in reality, I probably should have been wearing 41 millimeter. The Breitling Chronomat. Fun fact, this was the first watch that I ever bought when I started to make a little bit of money. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. The Chronomat, depending on the year, depending on the condition, depending on the variation, can be found between $3,000 and $6,000. Yes, you can find the gold variations for more. But again, we're not talking about the gold variations. We're talking about stainless steel between three and six grand. It's also produced between 36 millimeter and 44 millimeter. It's marketed as a unisex all-purpose watch. And as I said, it was the first luxury timepiece that I ever bought. I remember the day. It was called a white eye blue. It had a blue dial with white chronographs. And to me, it was just the most beautiful thing that I had ever seen. And I was so proud of myself for spending $10,000 on it brand new from the authorized dealer. Then I got home and looked on the internet and I can find the same one for $4,000 brand new with stickers on it from a secondary market dealer. I learned my lesson on that one. And that's actually what got me started in this industry was I realized there was a huge variation between buying from an authorized dealer and buying from a secondary dealer. Long story short, it segued me into this business. It's a really great piece you can go anywhere in. Flip-flops to a sports jacket. It will do anything and everything for entry-level money too. Number four, the Omega Seamaster Pro 300M. We've talked about this watch on the show before. It's nickname or commonly referred to as the SMP300. It can be found in all sorts of different colors and variations, but the price point is about three to $6,000. Now it can be found for more in the gold variation, but we're not talking about gold. We're talking about the stainless steel. It's a 42 millimeter diver with a coaxial movement, which is unique to Omega. These typically come on a rubber strap or stainless steel strap. It's a bit of a casual look on rubber. However, that's actually what I prefer. I prefer the SMP 300 on rubber. They make it in black rubber and blue rubber. I'm sure you can put other color rubbers on, but between stainless steel and rubber for the bracelets, I personally prefer the rubber. It's a little bit less expensive. I feel personally, it looks a little bit better than the steel bracelet. And it's a super awesome, tough, piece. For the price point, I think it's one of the best pieces, honestly, and I often recommend it to people starting with their first watch. All right, number five, I decided to put a Rolex in here. I was a little picky about which Rolex. Truth be told, there are less expensive variations of the Rolex that we're not going to cover on this show. The 16233 Datejust, the Rolex Datejust 16233, is an older Datejust. My opinion, not only from wearing them, they're a little small for me, but selling a lot of them, for the price point, they are the best entry-level, biggest value Rolex 
timepiece you can get your hands on. For instance, there's a 1503, which you can get for half the price, but I don't believe it has the value or wrist presence. So that's why I use the 16233 as the fifth example of one of the best entry level timepieces. You can get it between $4,000 and $7,000, depending on the variation. It's a 36 millimeter and it has a little bit of gold, which gold being on the case, on the uh, the crown, the bezel, and the bracelet for $4,000, having gold on your wrist and a Rolex, to me, it's a no-brainer. My favorite variation actually has a factory diamond dial. You can find them about five to $6,000, maybe $7,000, and they are considered vintage. They are a little bit older. You have to know what you're looking for or work with someone who does, as often these watches come as Frankensteins or fake. What a Frankenstein is, because they're 20, 30 years old, you know, about 30 years old, they've been through a lot of hands, they've been through a lot of dealers, they've been through a lot of watchmakers. And what a lot of people do is, and this is kind of like a taboo subject in the market, or I should say in our industry, is a dealer will get a hold of this vintage timepiece and send it to the watchmaker and have some aftermarket or not original pieces put on the watch to save a dollar because the margins are so thin selling them. And next thing you know, you have this watch that looks looks original, but is far from it. This is what we call a Frankenstein watch. A lot of these watches, unfortunately, come out of 47th Street in New York. So you have to be careful with these watches. You have to know what you're looking for if you're gonna buy one or work with someone that does. And of course, there are fakes of everything we're talking about, including this one. Another big piece that you should be cognizant of with this timepiece specifically because of the age, when you hold it up on its side, similar to this, right? And you hold it like this, because the, the uh, bracelet is 30 years old and it's metal, it's gonna sag. Sometimes they sag really bad and they look like this. Now, it could be fixed and repinned, but it will diminish the value and it will diminish the wear a little bit on your wrist. So if you're buying these, make sure you look at the sag of the bracelet. It's usually rated between zero and 100%. 100% it's straight across, there's no sag. 70% there's a little sag. 30% it looks like it's dilapidated. But the cool part about this watch is it could be worn with anything. And it's an entry-level timepiece. It can go to the gym, it could go to the beach, it could go to the wedding, it can go in a sports jacket, it can go to dinner. It could be worn recording YouTube videos and it looks like a lot more value than you pay for. A really good variation is about $5,000. All right, guys, that's what I got for you for the five best entry-level timepieces that we sell the most of, that customers buy the most of, that get traded the most, and are the most versatile. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are the world agreed upon industry-wide market. That's just my perspective. It seems to be pretty well agreed upon. Of course, people will disagree with me, but that's what I've got for you today. If you have any questions regarding anything that I went over or don't like where my microphone is or the audio sucks, just drop a comment below. But before you go, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and I'll catch you next time.